the concept of consilience. It's the idea that the principles of physics constrain the principles of chemistry, which constrain the principles of biology, which constrain the principles of psychology, which constrain the principles of the social sciences and the humanities. So everything is kind of connected into a continuous whole. It's important to realize, you know, at each level of explanation, there are new emergent entities that have their own properties. They're not predictable from the lower levels, because sometimes it's, some people who are opposing vertical integration think we want to make everything the Department of Physics. So we'll just get rid of, you know, we'll all be physicists, and that's absurd, because it's, you know, it doesn't happen in the sciences. You have physicists, you have quantum physicists, you have people who look at physics at a higher level, and they're in a, often in a different department. You've got physical chemistry and organic chemistry. They're not squished it together because organic molecules have these emergent properties that you can't, you can't predict from the lower level. And you need these emergent entities to talk about what's going on. And it's possible that in principle, maybe it's all predictable from some level of physics. Um, but I'm not actually sure it's, it's tractable computationally. And plus, it would be really stupid because right? we have these these heuristic categories at these new levels that do great work for us and have real explanatory force. Um, so, what vertical integration is not is saying that human level truths are just illusions that we're going to explain away once we get the neuroscience right. Uh, human level truths are like truths in organic chemistry. They're they're emergent categories of things like beauty or truth or intention are real, they describe something that's important to human beings and has real heuristic value. And we in the humanities study these concepts and how they interact. All vertical integration is arguing is that we've got to allow our understanding of these concepts when it's applicable to be informed by lower levels of explanation. And, and, we should, and that we should be troubled when there are conflicts between the two. Quantitative methods in, in certain contexts, not in every context, so it's not an all-purpose all tool, not every question in the humanities is going to, going to yield to scientific quantification. Uh, I don't think anyone thinks that or wants that. Uh, in, in my own work, I do quite a bit of traditional, you know, uh, close reading uh, type, type of work. Um, but there is a real deficiency, uh, a lack in qualitative methods, uh, softer humanities methods being applied to some sorts of questions. So if, so if you're talking about the, the novel Emma, and how Emma, uh, so, so a traditional literary scholar might say, well, people respond to Emma uh, because of, you know, in, in this certain way. They respond to Emma in this certain way because of factors X, Y, and Z. Um, the problem is that no one agrees with that person. So there's 50 or 100 other scholars who are writing about Emma, and they all disagree. And there's this riotous cacophony of all these different voices, and people just, it's a melee and a brawl, and there's no, you know, that would be fine. If there was some hope of coming to convergence finally and, 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 and coming up with a final, a final uh, conclusion, or at least a tentative final conclusion, which people could agree. Um, and the, what, what scientific methods do is they get data. Um, that will typically compel people to at least for the time being uh, support a tentative you know, conclusion. So one possibility is that readers are sort of unconstrained by authors when they read and that there's going to be massive variation between how I interpret a text and how you interpret a text. How I feel about characters and how you feel about characters, what emotions uh, this inspires. All that, that traditional humanist scholars can do with this is what, is what they've been doing for the last several decades. They can sit down, toss competing examples back and forth, and have a long argument without, without any sort of uh, decisive conclusion to it. Another approach to this, which I prefer for this kind of narrow class of empirical question, is to say, well, we can actually figure this out. We can go and we can look at readers in laboratory situations. This is something that we've done in our own work. Uh, me and uh, Joe Carroll and uh, some, some of our uh, collaborators have taken uh, 500 uh, avid readers and literary scholars and had them fill out questionnaires about how they thought about these stories, you know, what their interpretations were, and also how it made them feel. And the author is not dead. The author is, is exerting strong, constraining force over these stories. For the most part, there's a little bit of variation, but not very much. People generally think the same way about these stories, these characters, and they generally feel the same way.
feel happy or sad or scared or angry uh, in very predictable ways. So it's just one of these examples of something that, of a, of a humanities question that, 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 that uh, you know, actually has an answer that, that we can actually potentially go out there and find if we're willing to cross uh, these, these traditional boundaries between the sciences and the humanities. One of the difficulties, certainly, in an interdisciplinary study of literature, one that wants to incorporate um, biology and psychology, is that we, yes, we, we have to either um, master a huge amount of information outside our own field, or we have to go to other people who are experts and to get their advice. And in, in almost every field in the sciences, that's how people do things. They consult with others. They, they realize that the problem that they're interested in is, is simply touches on too many other things that they're not specialized in. So they collaborate, and that's not the model in the humanities. If we, if we incorporate something like uh, a, a, uh, a biological and psychological perspective on literature, then we are going to have to go to other people. And if we're going to do statistical work, we'll have to go to statisticians. Well, we ought to learn a bit of statistics ourselves to, to understand the consequences of, of what we're doing if we do quantitative work. But um, to, to really process the, the numbers, we probably need statisticians. And um, I, there's, I, there's no reason why a humanist can't go to a, uh, a wider pool of, of colleagues and use their expertise. Very often people, in, in uh, say in psychology, will be very excited to be drawn on. You can, you can track, say, using FM, fMRI scanning, you can track people's complicated responses to all, all the processing that they, they're doing. It's much much more, uh, as they say it's in science, ecologically valid. In other words, it reflects something like the real conditions of, uh, of human behavior, tracking other people, rather than uh, the kinds of simplified experiments they often have in psychological laboratories where you're simply tracking an image across a screen or you're pressing a button. Um, it, so it, it allows you to to look at human nature in, in its, some of its richest, most intense forms, looking, look at humans processing these rich representations of human nature in ways that are going to be stable because everybody's reading the same text. So you'll be able to track uh, individual differences or, or commonalities between people's responses to these, these complicated processings of, uh, of what's happening in, in the social world. Listening to what cognitive scientists have to say about the relationship between language and thought, um, what cognitive scientists have to say about how emotions interact with reasons and how they affect behavior. We have theories about all these things, and the, the problem is we just they're theories that we've just made up. <laughs> we don't have any empirical data for them. Right now there's a real hermetic seal between the humanities and, and then all the other fields of inquiry in science, which are vertically integrated, even though they're often talking about very different things, um, you know, organisms running around versus quantum physics, right? Not very similar on the surface of it, but there is a kind of vertical integration in the sense that there's got to be a broad consilience between what people in all these different areas are saying about the world. And that, that range of consilience at, at the moment stops at the boundary of the humanities. And then once you co come over to this side, we're now free to say whatever we want about anything here without paying attention to anything on the other side of the wall. So I think that wall needs to break down.